Last week, we started a series called Why, and the questions we wanted to answer are all why questions, and there's several, four in particular I'm focusing on about uh, that normally we as Christians find ourselves asking at some time in our life, or we have friends that ask the same question. And last week, we asked, why don't I always feel God's presence? And we talked about several things that could be going on in our own life that blocks us from feeling or, uh, or are really truly experiencing the depth of God's presence and to deal with those things. Next week, it will probably be the, the one question I hear most often. I've, I heard it three times last week. Uh, I hear it almost every week of my life as a, as a pastor. I'm being serious about that. You know, why doesn't God seem fair or... Sometimes it's couched as, why do bad things happen to good people? Why isn't God fair? How come it doesn't turn out the way I want it to turn out? And then the last week of this series, we're going to answer the question, why would God use someone like me? What do I have to offer the kingdom? But today is another one, probably the one I hear second most when it comes to why questions is, why didn't God answer my prayer? Why didn't he answer my prayer? And I think that that's a reasonable question sometimes when we read Scripture if we don't understand how God looks at the requests that we have of Him. In John chapter 14, verse 13, notice what it says. And I, God, will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will what? I will do it. Now, if we just read that on the surface, what does that sound like? All I need to do is put a nickel in the machine and out comes what I want. That's basically what it sounds like. If I just ask God, then obviously I should get what I want. And I don't know about you, but that has not been my life experience. I have prayed many times for many things and they didn't come. And then I look at Scripture and I think, but gosh, I mean, look at Joshua. He prayed that the sun would stand still and it did. How did that happen? Or Daniel prayed that the lions wouldn't, and he was saved from that. How does that happen? How come my prayers don't get answered? Or Jonah prayed and a fish swallowed him up and spit him out in safety on the shore. How did that happen? Why don't my prayers get answered like that? I pray sometimes and it feels like nothing happens. Anybody relate to that? Okay. I think all of us have prayed and we did not get what we asked for or it just seems like God isn't listening. Some of you have prayed for a sick loved one and the person died anyway. But we prayed. We prayed and we prayed. I hear that. I've done that. I have no people who have prayed to conceive a child, and they have yet to get pregnant. And my heart hurts for that, but they don't. Uh, Many people, young people especially, pray that their parents won't get divorced. They see what's going on in a family. Friends pray for them. Their parents pray for them, yet they get divorced anyway. What is going on with that? Does that mean God doesn't really answer prayers? Or is he even listening? So today, if you've ever asked the question, why didn't God answer my prayer? Let's try to answer that. And I want to answer it gently and and forthrightly from Scripture. And uh, hopefully we can gain some perspective on this. Um, First thing I think we need to realize is maybe, just maybe, you have a broken relationship. Maybe there is a broken relationship that you're dealing with. And I'm not just talking about a broken vertical relationship with God, which can happen. I'm talking about also horizontal relationships with each other. I mean, one of the things we learn about Jesus' mission on this earth when he came, he didn't come just to restore our relationship with the Father. He came to restore our relationships with each other. And so he puts a high priority on how we interact with one another and how we handle life's issues with each other. And our horizontal relationship actually affects our vertical relationship with God. And I don't think a lot of people realize that how we deal with each other really affects our relationship with God himself. In fact, in Mark chapter 11, verse 24, notice what it says. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, what are you supposed to do? Forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. He's saying if you have issues with someone in life and you haven't forgiven them, you need to because if you don't, it interferes with my relationship with you. 
Do you realize that? that? That reality of you not being forgiving affects how I even deal with you. So that, that horizontal relationship is important to God and it's important to us. First John tells us what? You can't hate your brother and say that you love God. You just can't do that. That doesn't work hand in hand because if you hate your brother, that means there's some problem with you. Okay? Jesus said in Matthew 5 that if you take your gift to the altar, right, if you bring yourself to God and there you remember someone has something against you or there's some kind of conflict between you and someone else, he tells us to leave our gift at the altar, go and be reconciled with that person before you even come back and talk to me. Why does he say that? Because your horizontal relationships affect your vertical relationship. There is something about how we get along with each other, how we handle conflict, how we handle life with someone that we might not be seeing eye to eye with that affects our relationship with God. And so he says, take it seriously. And so maybe for some of us, if we aren't having our prayers answered, maybe we have to look at our relationships with other people. Maybe we have to see, am I holding unforgiveness in my heart towards someone? Am I not resolving an issue with someone else? Am I hating a brother or sister for who they are or what they've done? Am I doing that in my own life? Because unknowingly, I'm affecting my relationship with God. Because those things are intertwined with one another. So it's a reasonable question for us to ask. I mean, think about it. You know, if, if you're raising kids, uh, maybe if, if any of you have had children and have had more than two and they were young at the same time, uh, they tend to fight. You ever notice that? How many of you know what I'm talking about? You guys were, that haven't got kids that age yet. You were the ones that fought. Okay, you fight with each other. I remember my boys would fight with each other. And I can't tell you how many times I looked at them and said, if you don't knock it off, you're not getting anything. Okay, you want this? No way. Until you are nice to your brother, until you take care of that situation, don't ever expect me to give anything good to you, basically, because why would I reward you for improper behavior towards your brother? I'm not going to do that. And that's what God basically says. Why would I reward you with answers to prayer if you're at odds with your brother and you're not taking care of it? Why would I do that? If a human parent gets that concept, I think God understands it as well. Well, that's not a very you know, merciful and gracious God. Yes, it is, because he wants us to fix that horizontal relationship. He says, that's so important to you. I don't want you damaged by those relationships. And we see this often in marriage. You know, some guys comes to church and he's praising God and looking all that great and on the way home he's chewing his wife out all the way home about something about the food about the dinner about the house whatever it happens to be first Peter 3 7 notice what it says husbands in the same way be what considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with say that really loud ladies I'm doing this for your benefit Come on, this is for you, okay? Respect as the, now don't have to say weaker partner because we'll have feminists saying, oh, women aren't weaker. Okay, whatever. I don't mean that in a direct, that means weaker, meaning that my job is to support you because that's my job, okay? The weaker partner as, and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that what? Nothing will hinder your prayers. In other words, husbands, if you're at odds with your wife and you're not treating them with respect and you're not giving them the due that they deserve or protecting them the way you should, why would I answer your prayers? Why would I do that? Because the horizontal relationship is broken and I can't answer that vertical relationship until you do something about it. He's driving us to deal with those things in our lives. So just maybe for some of you, the reason God has not answered your prayers the way you think they should, maybe you feel like it's just bouncing off a glass ceiling above you, is that there's a broken relationship that you haven't mended. Maybe there's something you need to do. Maybe you need to step in and do something. The second one is, first it's, you know, maybe you have a broken relationship. The second one is maybe you have the wrong motives. Maybe the reason you're asking isn't the right reason you should be asking for it. That comes out of James chapter 4, verse 3. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with what? Wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. Sometimes, if we're honest, we pray for certain things because we want something. And even when it sounds like we're praying for something really good, like, 
Lord, please change my wife so there's not so much strife in my life, right? Okay? Because it'd really be good if she would line up with all the things I need, she needs to line up with so that... Am I praying that for my wife or am I praying that for me? Okay? That's being selfish. I want something, so Lord, I'm asking you to change them so I don't have to because I want something from you, and it's really not about them at all. I'm asking with motives that truly aren't pure. They're selfish and they're self-centered. Remember the Pharisees, if you remember in Scripture, they'd stand on the corner and they would pray for what purpose? To get the people to notice them. To go, oh, wow, look at those really religious guys. They're out there praying and they sound so holy. They weren't doing it for God. They were doing it for recognition. Their motives were impure. And God has a hard time answering impure motives. He doesn't do that. You know, how many Christians have prayed, Lord, help me win the lottery? Because you know, God, if I did, I'd give a whole bunch of money to the kingdom, Right? I'd, I'd set aside like 50 million for myself, but I would give you a little bit, right, God? Because look at, look at all the people I could help if I could just win the lottery. You guys are all somber because you've all prayed that prayer, you heathen, just like me. Okay. How many of you bought a lottery ticket before? Okay. How many of you wait till it's like 400 million now to buy one? Because it went up to three bucks, and who's going to pay three bucks for that? Okay. Now, why do we do that? Why do we pray for those kinds of things? Because there's something that we want, God, for, for us, not necessarily for the other person, if we're being honest. Okay, bless my business, Lord, because if I'm successful, I can give so much more money to the kingdom. But I'd really like to be successful. Right? So bless my business, okay? Remember Paul in Scripture? Paul prayed about something. They called it a thorn in his flesh. We don't know what it was. Some say it was his eyesight. Other people say it was all kinds of other things. Who knows what it was? Scripture doesn't really tell us. But there was something wrong with Paul physically. And he prayed not once, not twice, but three times that God would remove whatever this affliction was from him. And what was God's answer? Nope. Not doing it. Okay? I'm not doing that. So sometimes we ask with wrong motives. Paul wanted some, some uh, ease in his life, and he did not get that. His motives were not pure motives. So sometimes we ask for the wrong things for the wrong reasons. Right? Absolutely. So make sure I'm following, because I missed the page in my notes here. Isn't that something? So... So secondly, maybe you have broken relationships. Maybe you ask from wrong motives. In fact, doesn't Scripture tell us that sometimes things seem right to us, but they're not? In fact, Proverbs 16, verse 2, what does it say? All a man's ways seem innocent to him, but motives are weighed by who? The Lord. Why are you asking for what you are asking for? What is the reason that you're asking is there something in that? Maybe it's a promotion. Oh, I want a promotion. Maybe I want, you know, just help. Maybe I would want you to bless me, but I'm not really thinking about others. Maybe, just maybe, my heart's not in the right place when I'm asking. So maybe God says no, because he doesn't want to bless you in those situations. Next, maybe you don't believe God will do it. Maybe you're asking, but you really don't believe God's capable of answering that prayer or that he really will do it. In fact, Mark 9 knows what it says. A person's talking to Jesus and, and kind of expresses their doubt. And he says, but if you can do anything, I, I, I love that, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. I love Jesus' response. If you can, you don't think I can do it? I mean, that's what he's saying to them. Everything is possible for him who believes. I mean, what a statement Jesus makes. What are, you, are you coming to me with, I don't know if you can, but if you can, attitude. He says, what do you mean, if I can? Of course I can. I can do anything I choose to do. I, nothing gets in my way if I don't want it to. You know, it's kind of like that story was told about this church that had this bar that was next door, and they wanted the bar shut down, so they began praying about it. Got the whole church praying for the bar to shut down. And lo and behold, after a couple of months of prayer meetings to shut this bar down, the bar burns to the ground. Now, the owner of the bar had heard about the church praying for the destruction of his bar, so he took them to court. 
and sued them because they had prayed for his, his, church, I mean, his bar to be burned down. And in defense, the pastor said, don't blame us. It wasn't because of our prayers that that bar burned down. And the judge looked at the uh, pastor and said, this is really odd. The bar owner believes in prayer, and you don't. <laughs> so is that how we do it sometimes? Is that how we do it? We approach God not truly believing it? We're told over and over and over in Scripture, things are done according to your faith. According to the faith that you have, things are done, and it will be done unto you. Or maybe that whole attitude that you see in so many people in so many situations is, we've exhausted everything, we may as well what? May as well pray about it. I mean, if all else has failed, we may as well pray about this. What is that telling us, honestly, about our heart? I don't know if God can really do it. So I'll just wait till it's a last resort and see maybe, just maybe, he might do something about it. So maybe you have a broken relationship, maybe your motives aren't pure, or just maybe, maybe, maybe it's that you don't believe he can do it. But we're told that God can do anything, and we should honor that. Next, maybe you don't believe uh, that he can do it, but... Well, excuse me, I didn't share one verse I wanted to read with you. Sorry about that. Maybe you don't believe God will do it. Did I get this messed up on you guys today? Okay, I did. Anyway, I'll figure it out. Hey, I got my notes all backwards in my Bible. Ever do anything like that in life? Forgive you. you forgive me? Okay. That verse in James 1.6, let me read this to you before we move on. But when he asks, that's you and I, he must believe in what? Not doubt. Not doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind, that man should not think he would receive anything from the Lord. That tells me is I can ask anything if I have enough faith. But if I doubt, it's hard for God to respond. Why would he give me anything in my doubts? So what about you? Are you doubting God can do it? Is God your first resort or your last resort? Do you pray expecting an answer? Okay. Do you pray even though you have a broken relationship or your motives are incorrect? How dare we expect anything from God? Do you pray and you don't really believe God will do it? Those are things that get in the way. They get in the way of our prayers. But I think this is the one that really is most often the answer to the question. Maybe God has something different. Maybe God has a different answer in mind than the answer you believe he should have. See, in my experience as a pastor and as a Christian, uh, God's will matters more than my will. And I'm not smart enough to know what God knows about every situation. I'm barely smart enough to tie my own shoes at times. And let's be honest, in comparison to God, we are just little infants. God has this all figured out. He sees the beginning. He sees the end. He knows what's going on. And sometimes he hears us pray and he goes, I don't know if that's a good idea. I don't know if I answer that way, if that's the best way to answer that question. I think there's some better way, maybe, or another way to do that, something different than what you expect. John, uh, 1 John 5, notice what it says. This is the confidence we have in approach, approaching God, that if we ask anything, what? According to his will. According to his will. He hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. I hate those little catchphrases, right? According to his will. If we're asking for something outside of the will of God, what does he say to us? No, I'm not going to do that. Even if you think it's within God's will, even if you believe it's good, even if it, you believe it's right, even if you believe that's how it ought to be done, if it's outside of his will, he says, I won't answer that. I need to do something different. 
something different. That whole situation about Paul asking three times, will God do it? No, he said something different in mind for Paul. He didn't answer the prayer of removing that, that affliction from Paul for one specific reason. He wanted to grow Paul through that time. He wanted to teach him that his grace was sufficient for him. That's what he said. Okay? He was doing something in Paul during that time. And he couldn't get that any other way but by saying no to Paul's request. Now, of all people that could have got an answer from God, you would have think Paul would have done it. I mean, he was the stalwart of the church, and he wrote most of our New Testament. He is the one that confronted the, uh, the authorities of the day. He's the one that truly exemplified what it meant to have a heart for God and the work that he did. He brought Christianity to the, non-Christians, uh, the non-Jews of the world at the time. If anybody deserved to have their prayer answered and would have been in touch with God about answering that prayer, it would have been him. And God said, no, I want to do something different in you. Okay? No, I'm not going to take that boyfriend you have and, and, and make them somebody that they're not because I don't think that boyfriend's good for you. I'm not going to bless that relationship. Why would I? I don't want to do that. I see what it could do. And you, I don't think that, that particular business transaction that you think is great for your company and all this, I said, I see what can happen if we go down that path. The answer is no. I'm not going to answer that the way you want. And maybe, just maybe, the stuff that you're going through, I'm having you go through for a reason. When you said, well, why is this happening to me, God? Why is all this coming down on my shoulders? Why all these struggles? Why all this strife in my life? Don't you really love me? Don't you really care? If you truly loved me and you cared, you'd protect me because my life ought to be easy, right? A lot of us believe that because the way we respond to God when life isn't easy is we complain to him about it. And God says, you know what? I could make your life really easy, but then you wouldn't grow into the person I want you to be. I mean, honestly, in my life, I don't know about yours, I learned most about God during the tough times, not the easy times. When he allows me to walk through a situation and he empowers me and he gives me strength and he gives me peace and he gives me courage, he gives me what I need during that time, I learned I can lean on him during those times. How else would I learn that if he gave me exactly what I wanted every time? It's just, it doesn't work that way, Okay. I want this house. Well, I don't think that's a good thing for you. I can see you can go bankrupt because of it, so I'm not going to give it to you. Why would I do that? Okay, That job that you think is going to be so great for you, well, that promotion is going to draw you away from me and draw you away from your family and draw you away from ministry, so why would I give you that promotion? Why why would I do that? If you really want to follow me, then trust me if I say no. It's okay. I have something different in store for you. I'm trying to teach you something, trying to prepare you. I'm trying to shape you and mold you for what it is I want you to do, not what you think you should do. And that's how God operates. So he doesn't give us what we want. And honestly, any of you who have prayed for something and God didn't give it to you, and then afterwards you saw why God said no, would you trade it for a yes? No, wouldn't do that. Why? Because what God had intended all along was so much better. Even if it was uncomfortable, even if it was painful. I mean, God uses that to shape us and to mold us. And I think this is where people have the hardest time. Uh, You know, I have prayed, you have prayed for people and something's happened terrible to those folks. And you go, why, God? Why would you allow a child to be hurt like that? Why would you allow someone so young to die? Why would you allow that to happen? And the question really before me is, do I trust him enough to know that he knows what he wants done? That maybe there's something better out there. Maybe there's something he wants to do through that situation to bless someone else. You know, those are tough questions in life, okay? And what we believe about prayer speaks to how we respond to all of those. I'm, I'm, I hesitate talking about it because I do get emotional about it, so I'll try not to. But when my son died in that drowning incident three years ago, I asked why, big time. God, I've committed my whole life to you. I gave up the cushy life to to serve you. 
Why would you allow something like that happen to a young man with so much promise? Why would you allow that? Why did that have to happen to me? Why? It's not fair, right? Why would you do that, God? I prayed that you would protect my family. I was praying for my son. I was praying for his life. I was wanting him to, to, to prosper as a young man. I had him in my prayers every single day. And you didn't protect him. But he did. I don't know what his future held if he had not died on that day. He could have been devastated in other ways. But I also know that because of his death, many of the people that he grew up with took a second look at Jesus. And I think that's a blessing, not a curse. I don't know what God saw. I don't know what God knows, but I know what I believe about prayer. And I think that's what it comes down to. You, What do you really believe about prayer? What do I believe about prayer? One of the things prayer does for me is it reminds me that I am not in control, but I need to stay close to the one who is in control. That's what prayer reminds me of. I'm not in control, but I need to stay close, because where would I be without that? Prayer is not about so much what I want, but God's will, whatever God's will is. I just want his will. If we think that just because we ask, we get what we ask for, what did Jesus ask for the night before he died? Remove this from me. What was God's answer? Nope. Was Jesus okay with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm reminded of the story in Daniel all the time about Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, Rakshak and Benny, for those of you that are Veggie Tail fans. Okay, if you remember, how many of you are Veggie Tail fans? Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. Oh, come on. Well, you at least got to go watch the one about these guys, because Rakshak and Benny is a good story. Uh, but the reality was they would not kneel to, to Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar said, Well, I'm going to put you to death for this. And he confronts them, and I love their response in Daniel chapter 3. This is a response that is how I personally choose to look at my God, especially when it comes to prayer. Here's what they said in response to Nebuchadnezzar saying, you're dying for what you're doing. It says, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is what? Is able. He's what? He is able. Is God able? Yes, I know my God is able to save us from it. And he will what? He will rescue us. You talk about confidence. We know he's able and we know he will do this. But even if he doesn't, well, that seems contradictory, doesn't it? They just said, I'm able, he's able, I mean, and I believe it, but even if he doesn't, we will not serve your gods. In other words, we will not give up on our God for your gods, even if we know he is able, even if, he know, even if we believe that he will do it. If he doesn't, I still believe, no matter what. What should we believe about prayer? Three things. Three things I believe about prayer. I believe God can. I believe God can. I believe God will. And even if he doesn't, I still believe. That's how I look at prayer. I think that's how we all as mature Christians should look at prayer. I believe God can. I believe God can do anything he wants to do. I will not limit him in any way, shape, or form. I believe he will do it because he says if I ask according to his will, it will be done. I believe it. I believe it can be done. I believe he will do it, but even if he doesn't, it will not shake my faith because he is God and I am not. And he knows what I don't know. And I am okay with that. Because what's the alternative? To be so upset about life that you can't even function because you don't get what you want? Or do you truly believe God is the one who cares for you more than you care for yourself? And I trust him in those answers. Even when I don't get what I ask for, I'm not going to throw them out the door. My God has proven himself over and over and over again. He has carried me through things over and over and over again. I have prayed for things that I know I was being selfish, and I'm glad he didn't give it to me. I'm glad my God's been patient. 
and that I can trust him. When you understand who this God is, when your prayer is not answered, you'll be on your feet worshiping him. You will, because he's still God. And he deserves our worship. And he deserves our praise. He doesn't really need our complaints. I trust him, no matter what. No matter what even if it's painful to trust. I believe that God can. I believe God will. Even if he doesn't, I still believe. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you in prayer because prayer is powerful. God, prayer can do whatever you can do if it's within your will. And God, I know that many of us feel like we're praying within your will at times when you know that that's not what you really want. And God, we just need to acknowledge before you today that at times all of us have doubted you because our prayers have not been answered. It's a human response, God. We know that. I want to thank you, God, for being the loving, patient God that you are that understands that we are weak, but you are strong. And so today, God, as we look to you in prayer, we pray that whatever we ask today would be in accordance with your will. That, God, we would pray and ask for the things you would have us to ask for. That we would only desire what you desire. God, that you would challenge our motives, that you would look in our hearts, that you would make sure, Father, that we have our relationships handled properly, that we wouldn't walk in a way in our Christian life that would hinder you from answering prayers. So that when we ask, God, may we truly be confident. May you give us the confidence that you're listening. But would you give us the humility to allow you to be God and be able to say no or to say something else needs to be done. And may we honor you anyway. I want to thank you, God, for being the prayer-answering God that you are. Today I know the most important prayer that you could answer for anyone is a prayer that says, I want to follow you. So if there's anyone here or online right now that just says, I need to follow you, I want to submit my life to you, I want you in my life, today's the day to, to say that and ask it. And in prayer, God says, yes, I'll answer that prayer. I'm there for you, and I will guide you and I will direct you. Just humble yourself before me. Accept the offer my son has given you, and now walk in faith. Father, thank you for the promises you've given us. Thank you for the God that you are. Thank you that you do hear every prayer. And God, I truly thank you that you answer them the way you see fit because you know what's best. Father, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.